let me see if I want to start with the scripture. So we are busy with, 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 with uh, being in him, knowing him. So this is the three parts. So the first part was understanding what it means to be in him through your asking. You must really spend time this year in those scriptures. Because those scriptures are crucial for 2020. Our asking and our believing. That is crucial. That we keep away any negative thoughts and attitudes and stuff in it concerning our asking. I know it can become tiresome and, and being challenging because sometimes we don't see the manifestations yet. But if you can see the manifest, first of all, if you can't see the manifestation of what you are trusting God for in the spirit, you're going to struggle to see it manifest in the natural. You see, the thing is, is with us is we want to see it manifest in the natural and then we're going to say, oh, we believed it in the spiritual. If you cannot believe it in the spiritual and see the vision, see your breakthrough in the spiritual, you're going to struggle to see it manifest in the natural. Because before everything existed, the spirit existed. Okay? That's why I teach you in this house in it. When was the last time, if ever, if you're trusting God for a house, if you're trusting God for a car, if you're trusting God for nice clothes or whatever the case may be, God has got no problem in things. The church has made things unholy, ungodly stuff. Because they think that because they can't handle it, they think that everybody that is trusting God for these things are chasing after these stuff. No, we need these stuff. On our way now to church, unseen myself, we were talking about a specific ministry here in Marshall Bay. I calculated because I know what they were pay, what they are paying for the place that they're renting now and for the place that they rented before the time, which they still use now. Because that was the charge that they asked us when we went and looked for the place. They are paying, thank God that the finances, I, I thank God that they are able to do it, you know, for themselves. So I don't have a problem in that. This is not the issue. But they are paying 90,000 plus rand a month to rent a place. For the two places. 90,000 rand. I said to Ansi, that's not right. It's awesome if God blesses them with the finances to do it. But if we own our own place, imagine what we can do with 90,000 rand a month. I mean, just renting this place in that for us is close on to 15,000. For these two, for the office and for this. But we need to. I can't keep on accommodating people in my personal house. There's a picky. I, I have no problem in doing it. Maar met oma en met lazy boy en met allerlei goeders en so aan en dit. En uh, I'll do it in the twinkling of an eye. If, if, if uh, I, I mean, if they sell this place and we are told to move, then that's the only option that we have open unless God does a miracle or something else in it, you know. And uh, uh, so, but in any case... But I mean, imagine what we can do with 15,000 rand a month if we have our own place. But you know what? I see it. I'm trusting God for it. But I'm not, no, no longer trusting God if I have to go back now with the asking thing, the first of all, understanding what it is to be in Him. is I'm not desperate anymore, although I'm desperate. Uh, uh, it sounds like a paradox now. I'm desperate for a breakthrough, but I'm not forced by my desperation. My desperation is not the controlling issue. It's my faith and my trust in God that causes me to rest in Him. But I still have a vision. I'm still trusting God. For Wednesday, I was walking here and I said, to Lord, I said to God, why can't we buy this place? I haven't received any notice yet that heaven is bankrupt. Or as a financial deficit or is in financial problems and stuff like that. I haven't received any notice like that yet. So until I receive a notice that heaven is in financial, has financial problems, I'm trusting my father for the finances. Because the year of yet, I want to be a good father to my family and I want to help them as far as I can until they get their financial breakthroughs and stuff in it. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So, but I'm not forced by desperation anymore in that sense that it became an obsession. My desperation became an obsession. So be careful when your desperation for a breakthrough becomes an obsession. Don't let your desperation become an obsession that forces you. But you do it in resting in Him because you've made your declarations and you still declare, I still declare. 
doesn't mean I, I, I stop, but my declaring is no longer an obsession or a desperation. It is because of what the word says. So I declare, I say, God, this is what your word says in Deuteronomy. And I'm part of the, uh, I'm part of the seed of Abraham in Christ Jesus. Don't throw Abraham away. And this is what your word says. I will give you houses, you did, uh, 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 cities you did not build. I want Mosul Bay. Port of Allah, Mosul Bay. Those are the two cities that you said I can have. I want them. And I want Mosul Bay. And you said you will give us houses filled with good things that we didn't even fill. I said these are promises. These are not even covenant relationship. These are promises that you gave to Abraham. Now I am in Abraham. And those promises are fulfilled in the seed of Abraham, which is Jesus Christ, which fulfilled all the promises given to Abraham. So those promises must be fulfilled in my life. That settles it. I'm no longer desperate. But I still do my declarations. So when was the last time, if you're trusting God for a house, that you got in your car, and I'm going to challenge you on this, that you got in your car, drove around, and looked at the houses or that you would like to. We've got two specific houses that we would like to own. Two. One of the two. But God can give us something similar in the area, because God knows what we desire. So God can give us something similar in the area that we want to. But if it can be one of those two, I would be rejoicing. I would say, oh, Jesus. Thank you so much. But every now and again, we don't do it every day, but every now and again, you know, when we come from church, I would shoot, take the slipway up and I'd drive past the, that house and I will see the sign is still up for sale, for the owner. And I said, God, this house will not sell. I don't know where I'm going to get the finances from. <laughs> but in any case, heaven is not bankrupt. You have it somewhere, somewhere. You've got it stashed. I'm going to buy lotto tickets until I, no, you know. So, Lord, somehow, some way, it, it can, and for the other house that's close by where we currently live. And then I pick up books, you know, these real estate, realty uh, uh, pamphlets and magazines and stuff, and I lie in bed or I sit in my office and I page through it or I sit in front of the TV when I've got nothing to do and I page through it and I look at the houses. I don't look at the prices first. I look at the size of the house. Does it have the enough bedrooms that I want? Does it have the office that I want? Does it have the, st the, 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 the TV room that I want? Is, does it fulfill my desire? And then I will encircle it because it's in the area that I would like to live. Then I, and then I look at the price. Oh, 7 million, 12 million, 6 million. I say, that's small change to my God. Yeah. This week I looked at the, sorry if I'm taking up some time, but it's okay. This week I looked at some photos of another prophet that's going through a terrible time right now on social media. I looked at the house that he lived in, and I think he lost this house. I don't think he owns the house anymore. And uh, and I looked at this house and I thought, yes, yeah, if you can do it, it's a South African prophet. He, he, he yeah, up the coast, not in Mosul Bay, but up that way. And, uh, and I looked at photos of his house and I thought, yes, yeah, if I can live in a house like that, if that is what you can. Uh, and, and then he, he mentioned, you know, what was his income until all this terrible stuff happened to him. I mean, I looked at what his income was and I thought, yes, yeah, his income, his salary is what we get for the church in a monthly basis. That's just his salary. So how much income did he get with the church as well? No. I thought, yes, yeah, if you can bless that prophet like that, surely you can do it for me too. Don't miss next week, calling an assignment. We're going to drill outside because we are changing into a military thing now. I'm serious. God, they, they, they know. And everything, I've got confirmation for everything that God showed us. Yes, you don't want to know the dream I had on Friday night. We'll share it. All right. So, but in any case, so, um, so when was the last time you drove past the house or looked at some magazines and stuff and that and encircled it and said, yeah, Lord, this is not in desperation, but in faith. Yeah. When was the last time you stopped at some garages here? And, and uh, I unseen myself, we had one garage that we used to stop here in Mosul Bay, except now for the gar uh, Jaguar garage and that in in, 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 in George. But even when we came from Portable for a three-day break, when we, you know, we would stop at, at uh, uh, um, yeah, at the point, what's that garage down the corner? Space Bona. Space Bona. 
I don't know why we stopped there, because they had nice cars. We would stop at Space Bona and look at the cars in the day and say, ooh, look at this nice car, look at that nice car. Ooh, this would be nice, that would be nice. But my desire was always the Jaguar. All right. But so, so why don't you do stuff like this? You know, don't just sit and listen in church. Go and do some practical stuff. Because if you cannot lay hold of it in the spiritual, you will not see it manifested. In the natural. And then keep on doing it until it manifests. I have to keep on doing it. I can't give up now. I've got too much prayer invested. I've got too much vision invested. Even with the ministry, I've got too much invested in the ministry to pack up and go. All right. So... I don't know how I got to that. So that was the first one, is in asking. Then the, then the, 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 the second portion was, what, what was the second portion? Uh, the second portion was under, resting in Him. Resting in Him. Understand what it means to really, we, when we've done it before, and I told you last Sunday, all that I am doing right now, is it's nothing new. You, you ought to know all this stuff now. You know all this. So all that I'm doing now is I'm stirring up what has already been deposited on the inside of you. I'm just bringing it to the surface so that you can be reminded of it. And sometimes we need to be stirred up again. What is already on the inside. You know the stuff, but it's got to be stirred up. And what we're busy now is part three is prayer. Praying. Being in Him. Prayer. All right. And then we looked at the prayer of Jesus in John 17, and we went to 1 John and, uh, and stuff like that. And then we just glanced over Matthew 6. So before we go back to Matthew 6, is um, so go to Luke 1. I want you to see some things today. I, I don't know how I'm going to put everything together. I've just got the scriptures. But I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to lead me. Because this is so awesome. So today we're going to look at, 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 at not just only individual prayer, but at the power of corporate prayer. And Wednesday I showed you this picture and I said to you, you see, when they were together, they were praying and tongues like fire. When they were praying, do you know that they weren't even filled with the Holy Spirit yet? Yeah. So they were just praying. So they were praying in Hebrew. Whatever Hebrew sounds like, and you know, I can't speak Hebrew. And uh, I studied it, but I still can't speak it. All right. So, but yet they were praying in their language. Now imagine having the Holy Spirit to help us in our weaknesses when we don't know how we ought to pray, that comes and helps us how to pray. The power that is released when we pray. And what was that? That was corporate prayer. It was a group of people that came together that prayed. And you know what? They didn't have one prayer session. They stuck it out for how many days? They prayed for days and days. They came together. Maybe during the day they went to their different jobs in it, but in the evening they came together in the upper room and they prayed. The next day they left, they went and did their business, and then they came back the evening and they prayed. And they continued praying until what Jesus said manifested. Corporate prayer, the power of corporate prayer. Okay, so Luke chapter 1. Now, uh, 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 um, uh, 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 what's his name? Is um, Zacharias. He's the priest of the time, and he's in the temple, and uh, his wife Elizabeth, uh, now he's pregnant and stuff like that. So, um, verse 9. According to the custom, Luke 1 verse 9, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of people was praying. I'm just maybe going to read some scriptures, and, and, but there's no in-depth. So, And the mult, whole multitude of people was praying outside at the hour of incense. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him. When did the angel of the Lord appear? When the whole multitude of people came together to pray at the time of incense. And I told you last Sunday that this is what happens. 
prayer has the ability to take you from the natural into the supernatural. Prayer has the ability to open up the spirit realm. You're going to see that today. Prayer has the ability, the power to open up the supernatural realm. Prayer has the power to get you from the natural into the supernatural. To get you from where you are into where He is. Now we know that He's in us, but we also know that He's around us. And we also know because He's God, He has the ability to be in heaven too. He's omnipresent. So prayer has that ability, and I'm going to say it again, to get you from the natural into the supernatural, to get you from where you are to where He is. Also the opposite. Prayer has the ability to bring the supernatural down into the natural. It also has the ability to have His glory in the super to be manifested where you are in you. That's the power of prayer. So why won't we pray? I'm challenging myself. So why won't we pray? So why would we make statements and say that it doesn't work or how long or whatever? And, that, and I know we grow tired. I grow tired too when I say to the Lord, Ach, here I will long. And then I sing that awesome gospel song and that, that we used to sing in the Afrikaans. Too, oh, long, oh, long, for us a troop me dank. You know, drippel kies maak ons reeds dank. Bar my here die behoefte is groot. You know, if you come out of the Pentecostal church. All right, so now listen to this. The, the whole multitude of people was praying outside at the hour of incense. Then, now, now remember that word incense. You're going to see something. To, I hope I'm going to get there. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him. To whom? To Zacharias. When the people came together and started praying. So this means that I haven't seen angels lately, so you are not praying enough. Okay, no. Appeared to him standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. Okay, you can go and read the rest, what happened with the angel and with Zechariah. But this is the thing and it is, is there is power. I, Im, imagine the power released when a corporate body. That is why the word, we, we know that, don't take scripture out of context. We know that Jesus is with us. We know the Holy Spirit is with us. Never mind in us, with us. We know the Father is with us. We know that there is uh, uh, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, myself. So there's already four. But imagine what the word says when the word says, we two or three are gathered in my name. So imagine it's me and the Holy Spirit. It's already two. Imagine it's me, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus. It's already three. Imagine it's me, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus, and the Father. It's already four. Imagine the power that is released when two or three are gathered in His name. So imagine the power that can be released when a corporate body of five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten people more can come together and start lifting their voices and start making a sound. I think it must have been awesome with the walls of Jericho. So imagine when a corporate body starts lifting up their voices and they start going, and they start creating the sound of victory, of declaring. Oh, man. Imagine supernatural stuff. Go to chapter 3. Now, here's Jesus. Now, that was corporate, but here's Jesus now. He's now praying. Luke chapter 3, verse, I'll tell you where now. Yeah. Now, the next scriptures that we're reading, okay, let's, let's first read. Uh, verse 21, Luke 3, 21. When all the people were baptized... It came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was open. Look what happened when Jesus prayed. The heavens opened. 
That's the power of prayer. Prayer gives you an open heaven. Hopefully the heavens are open. I know it is. But prayer will get you a manifestation from an open heaven. What happened? Jesus prayed, the heaven was open, and the Holy Spirit descended in a bodily form like a dove upon him. It doesn't say, you see, you, you, you get this picture. You get this picture of a dove coming down, a white dove coming down. It doesn't say the Holy Spirit. You see, this is how we get wrong pictures in our heads. Nowhere does it say the Holy Spirit was a dove. It said it came down like a dove, gentle. What he looked like, we don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us what he looked like. Was it in a spirit form? Was it the spirit form of a man? Was it? it says, but when he came down, it was like a dove, gentle. In bodily form. Listen what he says. He says, in bodily form, like a dove. Doesn't say he was a dove. And a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved son, in you I am well pleased. Now, now, now listen, Jesus was praying. And when Jesus was praying, the next moment, the disciples saw whoosh, heavens opened up. And here comes the Holy Spirit whoosh, and descended upon heaven, upon Jesus. And a voice speaks out of this open heaven and says, This is my beloved son. And here the disciples and everybody that got baptized heard and saw Jesus praying. And they saw what happened. I'm, I'm taking you somewhere. I'm taking you somewhere. Go to chapter 9. I'm building up to go somewhere. Go to verse Matthew, uh, Luke 9. Go to verse, go to verse 18. No, go to verse. Okay, you know the story We. You know, the people came together. Jesus made them sit down. There was not enough food, the fish and the five loaves. So, verse 14. For there were about 5,000 men. Then he said to his disciples, make them sit down in groups of 50. He told them, feed, you feed them. He said, we don't have anything to give them. He says, what do you have? They say, you know, to buy food for all these people. And there were about 5,000 men. He said, verse 14, make them sit down. And they did so and make them all sit down. Then he took the five loaves and the two fish. And looking up to heaven, he blessed. In other words, he was praying. He blessed and broke them. And gave them to the disciples to set before the multitude. So they all ate, 5,000 men. Not counting the women and the children. So here's Jesus praying. Here's a multitude busy praying. Let me back up. The next moment, an angel manifests itself because the whole multitude was praying. And manifested himself to the priest. Here Jesus, our high priest, is praying. Heavens open. So supernatural stuff happens when you pray. So heavens opened. Holy Spirit in bodily form. Voice out of the heavens. This is my beloved son. So here multitudes are together. They were not praying. Jesus was praying the first one. So Jesus says, give it to me. So here Jesus looks at it and he blessed it. In other words, he was praying over it. Father, bless it. So he spoke a blessing over it. Now you've got to understand this. When, 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 when Abraham laid his hands, or was it Jacob, laid his hands on Isaac, uh, uh, when Isaac laid his hands, I think it was on Jacob and on, 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 on Esau, the word says that he invoked a blessing upon Jacob. Now to invoke a blessing means you are calling something down from the heavens. So he spoke supernatural blessings from heaven down upon his sons, upon Jacob. All right? So here Jesus is, he lifted his eyes and he looked to heaven and he spoke a blessing. Listen what it says. He blessed and broke them and he gave it. So now something supernatural must happen. We are supposed to expect something to happen. 
But now what happens? We get up and we walk away and nothing happened. And tomorrow what we trusted for, what we prayed for, doesn't happen. And what happens? We become disappointed. Instead of believing the power that we had when we released it, when we were praying, that it will be manifested in my life. So now we give up on our prayers. So in other words, hear me now. This is not something that I thought about. This is something, this is something that was just dropped into my spirit right now. So listen carefully to what I'm saying now. When you give up on your prayers, you have given up on yourself not believing that you have the power to get the things manifested. So you're doubting yourself. So you're not doubting God. You can't blame God. When you begin to speak about not seeing the manifestation of what you've prayed for and what you're trusting God for, it means that you are doubting the very power that is supposed to be operating in you. You're doubting yourself. For you will receive power. So you're doubting yourself. You're doubting the very power he said you will have. Ouch. Me too, ouch. And then they ate, and they were all filled. Go back to Luke 9. There, I missed it. Before we go to Luke 11. Go back to Luke 9. So here Jesus looked at the fish, and he broke it. Then afterwards, he took his disciples to a, a place and he was praying. All right. So go to verse 28. Luke 9, 28. I knew I missed something. Now it came to pass about eight days after these sayings. He took Peter, John, and James and went up on the mountain to pray. As he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered. How many of you believe that when you're praying, the appearance of your face can alter? I mean, I mean I've seen it. I really have seen it. I've watched some people praying. And their whole face altered. No, we're not talking about that alteration. Okay, you know, grimacing, look like you're in pain or constipated or... Or whatever. We're not talking about that face alteration. We're talking about the glory of God being manifested. Hello? You, you hear what I'm saying? So the, look what happened. And uh, went up to the mountain. He prayed. His, the, the appearance of his face was altered. And his robe became white and glistening. And behold, two men talked with him, who were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, his exodus, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Look what happened. The moment that Jesus prayed, he brought the supernatural into the natural realm. Do you now see what I'm talking about? Yes, I'm getting excited now about this. The moment that Jesus started praying, he brought the supernatural, the spirit realm. He brought the spirit realm into the natural, natural realm. And I, I, I want to slap some people. I'm going to shock some people now. Because a lot of people, and, and, and we've got to be careful with this. We really, I don't know whether I should say it. Okay. There's a, okay, I'll leave it for somewhere else. When we have evening services, when I talk about do you believe in ghosts and we switch off all the lights. People are quick to say, oh, when the spirit of a deceased person appears, it's a demon. I saw, I saw it again this week, those end time preachers. So why didn't Jesus rebuke Elijah and Moses? They appeared in bodily form because the disciples saw them. I mean, Peter wasn't even amazed when he saw them. He knew immediately who it was. He hasn't seen them for two, three thousand years. They died long before Peter was even a twinkling in his father's eye. Yet he knew who they were. And listen to Peter, he wasn't even go. I, I mean, I would have, if I knew who it was, I would go, Wow! Moses, Elijah! Woo! <laughs> 
He looked at them and he said, can we build three houses for you? Three huts. Let's put up three huts. He wasn't even amazed. Hmm? But look what happened when Jesus prayed. He brought, he brought them from the spirit realm. They were dead. He brought in the natural. He brought their spirits and they appeared in bodily form. I'm not saying go and call up dead people now and say, Oh, Moses. Moses. You're going to call Moses. Is Moses going to answer back and say to you, I'm not taking my shoes off again. <laughs> okay. You know. Like Prophet Quibus always used to say, Moses, take off thy shoes. And the Lord said, sure, Moses, put it back on. <laughs> okay, so he prayed. And verse 31, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, his exodus, not his dying, his exodus, his leaving, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Okay? But Peter and those with him were heavy with sleep, and when they were fully awake, they saw his glory, and the two men who stood with him. So prayer has the ability to open up the supernatural. Now go to Luke 11. Verse 1. So keep your finger there, then go to Luke, Matthew 6. I think it's much nicer in Matthew 6. Then go to Matthew 6. We're going to look, read Luke 9. And then we're going to jump right back to Matthew 6. If you finished finding Matthew 6 and you're back in Luke 11, just say, praise the Yara. Okay. Luke 11 was verse 1. Are you still cool enough? Is it okay? Okay. Now it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place. You see, again, Jesus was praying. When he sees that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. So Jesus, teach us how to pray. Okay? Now you read the same thing in, in, in Matthew 6. So why did the disciples, I, I have my theory, so I'm just going to share my theory with you, and I don't think I'm wrong. Because we just read a few scriptures before Jesus, before they asked him. I think that the reason why the disciples came to Jesus and said to him, please teach us how to pray also, is because they saw the things that happened when he was praying. They saw, man, here's Moses and Elijah. They saw when he lifted his eyes and he prayed that fish and fish, I'm saying fish and chips, <laughs> that fish and chips and, and bread and sandwiches multiplied. And when he prayed, you know, things start, heavens opened up and the Holy Spirit descended and stuff. And here Jesus is praying again. And I thought, no, 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 no. Let, let, let's ask him, Jesus, will you please teach us how to pray as well? Because we, we want to see the supernatural stuff happening. Now, if we can understand and lay hold of that and grasp that, we will never again just pray the Our Father, O oh, Our Father which art in heaven. Because in that there's a mystery, in that there's a power that is getting released when you understand what you are praying when you're praying that. Because Jesus will not just teach you a prayer to pray just to have a prayer to pray and say, Oh, I've prayed. No, no, no. When Jesus prayed, supernatural things happened. So now he's with his disciples. So jump back to Matthew 6. So verse 9. In this manner therefore pray. I don't know how we're going to get to the end of this teaching. Our Father in heaven. This is a corporate prayer. So when you are together, you pray like this. Our Father. So just maybe in the book of Acts, this is what they were praying. Oh, our Father. Oh, we don't know how we ought to pray. Jesus said, go and wait in the upper room. So let's pray what he taught us. Because we know supernatural stuff happens. When he prayed, the heavens opened, the Holy Spirit came. He said, go and wait until you have the Holy... Oh, here, here comes something. He said, go and wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes. So Jesus was praying. So let's start praying the way that Jesus taught us. So that the heavens can open. So that the Holy Spirit and fire can come down. So just maybe they were praying the Our Father corporately together. But you can pray it as an individual too. Our Father who art in heaven. 
Okay, but let's use it now as a corporate prayer. But you can make it personal too. So our Father who art in heaven, because now He's died, He has deceased, He has exodus, He has left. So now we and brought the kingdom to us and heaven to us now. Now we can pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, thank you. Not only are you in heaven, but you brought heaven to me. You just started the Our Father. You brought heaven to me right now. So thank you that I don't have to go there to, ex to experience the supernatural, to experience my breakthrough. Thank you that you brought heaven to me. So Father, you are with me. You are not far away in heaven. So thank you, my Father who art in heaven, but also who art with me, heaven in me right now, in Jesus' name. Hallowed be your name. Hallowed means, let your name be set apart for worship. Let your name be made holy. Let your name, now I'm praying to our Father. So, hallowed, let your name be set apart for praise and worship. Let your name be made holy. Oh, I want to praise and worship you. Rema sabri. And all that you said is, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And now you are already praying. 20 minutes in it. Oh, I praise and I worship you, Lord. I glorify your name. And you just said, let hallowed be thy name. Yeah. Now you carry on. Oh, your kingdom come. Thank you. Corporate prayer. We all pray this together now as well. Thank you that your kingdom came. Ha! The kingdoms of this world have become kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ. Thank you that we can rule and reign with your kingdom over all the kingdoms of this earth. And it. Your king, oh, and you start praying the kingdom prayers. And all that you said is, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Check my track in a while. See where you are now already heading with your prayers. Now you carry on. You say, oh, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Ha! Stop there, Lord. I know what your will is. Your will is to bless me and to prosper me. Your will is and your thoughts is to give me a hope and a future. I know what your will is. I read your will in the books of Abraham, which you spoke to Abraham. So I know what your will is. In Christ Jesus, all God's promises are yes and amen. So in heaven, there's no poverty. In heaven, there's no sickness. In heaven, there's no unhappiness. In heaven, there's no disease. So right now I pray and I command, let it be done on earth, in my house, in my life, in my family, right now in Jesus' mighty name. Joy, peace, happiness, prosperity, and let it be done on earth. I'm blessed, I'm prosperous, I'm, uh, I'm everything. Uh, I don't have words. Huh? And all that you said so far, so, so far. I'm so, I'm so excited now. But it's because it's hot. And all that you said so far was, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Yeah. Now you begin to pray His will. That alone can take you an hour. Yeah. Now you carry on. Give us this day our daily bread. Father, you know what I need today. The first bread that I need to eat is your word because your word says you are the bread that came from heaven. So you take communion <laughs> while you're praying the Our Father. This is the bread. And your word said that if you eat my body and you drink my blood, if I eat your body, your words abide in me, then I will abide in you. You abiding in me. Sorry, there can be no death. I'm eating your bread. Man shall not live by bread only, but by every word. Now you go back to the words, and you start taking your Bible, and you start pointing at Scripture, and you say, ah, the word says, man shall not live by bread only, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Father. Father, this is what you said. I didn't say, this is what you said. You spoke it over me. And all that you said in it is, is give us this day our daily bread. Now you carry on. And forgive us our debts. Forgive us for going into debt. Other translation, or in Luke, it will say, forgive us our sins because we didn't trust you. Now, don't go in a guilt trip because you have debt. Don't go in a guilt trip. Okay? There's no condemnation. But we need to get to a place where we don't go into debt. 
don't have to go into debt. But we can still pray, forgive us our debts. So Father, help me to get out of debt. As we forgive our debtors, as we forgive those that gave us the debt. Have you seen how easy it is to go into debt today? Banks phone you and offer you credit cards. They want you in debt because that's their controlling power. So you fall for a world system. When the word says, do not be conformed to this world and its way of doing things. Hello? Let's carry on. But don't go, there's no condemnation. I'm not condemning you. If you have debt, start praying this and trust God to get you out of it and start trusting God to give you the finances to, th- to start paying it back so that you can get out of debt. And then don't try not to go back into debt again. I hear everybody say, oh, I want to be debt free. I want to be debt free. I don't. Now, don't shoot me down now. You think now this sounds like double-mindedness. No, a lot of people, oh, I want to be debt free. I don't want to be debt free. Because when you're debt free, it means you still don't owe anything. You just don't have debt. Do you know how many tramps and boomerlars and bums and stuff are on the street in that, that are debt free? How about getting wealthy? I want to prosper. I don't just want to be debt free. Debt freedom means I still cannot afford some stuff. I want to go to overflow. Thank you. I want to go to more than enough. I want to go to good measures, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Man will be put into my bosom. Man, I, I want to get to a place in it where I look at the stuff and I say, hey, these are the leftovers. I can't build more storehouses. I mean, I've got money in First National. I've got money in Standard. I've got money in NetBank. I've got money in Capitec. I've got money in Bitvest. I've got money. There are no more banks in Moscow Bay that I can bank my money in. I've got too much money. I mean, I can't even sleep well at night because my mattress is so uneven, you know, because of all the money that's underneath the mattress. If you cannot see it in the spirit realm, it will not be manifested in the natural. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Father, thank you for keeping us safe. For yours is the kingdom. Thank you, Father, that that kingdom now belongs to me because I have a scripture that says the kingdoms of this world have now become your kingdoms and that kingdom, it is the Father's good pleasure to give me the kingdom. I receive your kingdom. A kingdom that cannot be shaken. A kingdom that cannot be lost. A kingdom that cannot be moved. Thank you that I can live in that kingdom. And all that you started praying was our Father. For yours is the kingdom and the power. And the glory forever. I just want to throw this in. I just want to throw this in. Let me go to Acts. Goes along to Acts chapter 1. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. We touched on X earlier through this teaching. A lot of preachers make this mistake, and I saw one. I, I know him well. Oh, I know him. I prophesied over him years ago. Again, talking about be careful that you don't take God's glory. He's got a lot of truths. He preaches nice truths. But just like me, we still need to learn some stuff. Man, after, I, I, I don't want to share now what I want to share on, on next week. But after 30 years of moving in the prophetic, I learned something. Something just opened up to me on Wednesday night. Yuck, it's something hit me. And I thought, thank you, God, that I still don't know everything. Just because God revealed some stuff to me last week. Awesome. 
It's going to be challenging. So, so we all still learn. So I hear preachers still make this. You've got to be careful that you don't take the glory from God. First of all, who do you think you are to think that you have that it's possible for you to take God's glory. Oh, when you, when you take glory for what you have done, you still cannot take the glory from God. The word says that He gave us His glory. Go and check your scriptures. It says that He will not share His glory with another. If you go and read the context of that scripture, it means he will not share his glory with other idols, with other gods. He will share it with you. So you are a carrier of his glory. He already gave his glory to you. So who do you think you are to say? No, don't, stop saying, oh, don't take the glory from God. Go and manifest his glory. You see, we, we use the wrong words. What we actually should, should say there is be careful that you become not become so prideful that you think it was you that did it. It was because of God's grace, God's mercy, God's power, God's anointing, God's enabler that you were able to do that. But He has given us His glory. We're supposed to manifest His glory. So stop saying that, oh, you, you don't take God's glory for yourself. He gave it to me, man. I've got to manifest it. When I speak other stuff, then I become prideful. Oh, look what I have done. It's got nothing to do with glory. It's got everything to do with pride. Hello, did you get that? Yeah. Right, Acts chapter 1. I'm going to race through this. Verse 13. Now when they had entered, they went up into the upper room. Now just stop there. Now remember, when the disciples saw all these supernatural things happening when Jesus prayed, they came to him and they said to him, teach us how to pray. So the our father came after they saw all these things, Elijah, Moses, heavens opened, bread multiplied. So they saw all these things happening. So now they say, teach us how to pray. So now Jesus gives them the power, the ability to pray. They haven't received the Holy Spirit yet. So now before he ascended, he said to them, go and wait in the upper room until you've received power from on high. So now they all came together in the upper room. Verse 30. They went up into the upper room where they were staying. Peter, James, John, and all the others. And, 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 and. Verse 14. These all continued with one accord in prayer. See, here we're back with the corporate prayer again. They were all together with one accord in unity. In prayer and supplication with a woman and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Yeah. Now, and in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether, a number of names was about a uh, 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 120 and said. And then he said a lot of things. Now, jump down to chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost, so now they kept on praying. So just maybe... Listen to me now. I said it before. So just maybe, looking at this picture behind me, they were all in one accord, busy praying. They weren't filled with the Holy Spirit yet, so they were not praying in tongues. So just maybe they were praying the Our Father, because Jesus taught them how to pray. So just maybe they were praying the Our Father, and they kept on praying, and they kept on praying because they had a promise. They didn't stop until they saw the manifestation of the supernatural. So they kept on praying. So when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven. Look what
what happens when you begin to pray in unity. And even when you begin to pray in unity with the word, we can make it individually as well. When you stand in unity with the word, not with your feelings. Yeah. Hear me this morning. I'm desperate. I'm not here because I want a big church. I'm here because God has called me to equip you. I want to see, I don't want to see you fail. I want to see the people that God has placed me over. I want to see them step out in victory. I want to see them break through. I want to see them get what God has promised, man. That to me is the biggest joy, is to see people, man, hit the devil and keep him down and walk in power and victory. So hear me. Don't go with your feelings. We don't deny the feelings. We have feelings. The year of it, many times I want to give up because I feel like that. But here they were in one accord. So when you come in line with the word, you get into one accord with what his word says. And you begin to pray in one accord with what his word says. Not what your feeling tells you. Because feelings cannot always be trusted. So when you start praying what your feelings tell you to pray. Now they can be good feelings. But don't be moved by feelings only. If your feelings don't line up with the promises and the word of God. Then don't pray with your feelings. But if your feelings line up with the word and the promises of God, because sometimes you feel like, wow, man. You feel, ooh, I'm excited. Like what I felt like when I was praying, my feelings played a role. But my feelings were in line Wednesday with what the word of God says. And God started opening up some stuff for me in the spirit that I started seeing. So my feelings did play a role, but it was in line with what the word of God said. But if my feelings are negative and you start going with your feelings, guess what you're going to get? Negative. Yeah. Hello. They all continued in one accord. So get into one accord with what the promises of God say. And start speaking the word of God. Start praying the word of God. Lord, this is what your word said. I did it this week again. I think it was on Friday or Thursday. Sitting behind my desk. I've got two, two uh, A4 pages that I printed it in red. Where Jesus said, the two different scriptures where Jesus said, Whatsoever you ask, believing. And the other one, whatsoever you ask in my name, desire. Whatsoever you desire. I said, I didn't say it. You said it. I said, these are my desires. I've got it on my board. I said, that house, that house, that, uh, that building. I said, these are my desires. And your word says, my feeling is, is here, I, don't know I don't know anymore. But I'm in one accord with the word. I say, this is what your word says. And I point at it. It's on my whiteboard. And I face it. I say, this is what your word says. Yeah. Not what my feeling says. And somehow, some way, I'm going to see the manifestation of it. I just don't, this is the mystery. I just don't know when. Yeah. That's the mystery. But I rest in this, you do. Yeah. You do. Hello? Okay. Let's carry on. Let's finish. They were with one accord. Where were we? Verse 2. With one accord in one place, verse 2. And suddenly, there came a sound from heaven. Listen, there will be a suddenly in your life. There will be a suddenly in your life. There will be a suddenly in your life when you will hear the sound and say, go and sign the contract. There will be a suddenly in your life when you will hear a sound that say, go and make an offer. There will be a suddenly in your life when you will hear the sound that says, check your bank balance. There will be a suddenly. When will that suddenly happen, Willie? Only when you expect it. 
If you don't expect anything to change in your life, you will not hear this suddenly. Let's carry on. Of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then appeared up to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each other, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. There they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues. I mean, now, man, power gets released. Oh, glory to Jesus. Go to chapter 4. Can I have 10 more minutes? Matthew, uh, Acts 4, chapter uh, 4, verse 23. And being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God, who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David said, and now they were praying, Okay, so here they are praying, verse 28, to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Look what they were praying. To do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before. Lord, do whatever your hand and your purpose to do before. Do it. Now, if we want to... God to do what he purposed before, we need to start the Genesis. What was his purpose? And he blessed them. Yeah. Now do what you purpose to do. That was their prayer. You will lay hands on the sick. Purpose to do what you have said. Yeah. When we lay hands on the sick, let them recover. You shall declare a thing and it shall be established. Purpose to do what you have said you're going to do. Do it. In my name you will cast out demons. Purpose to do what you have said. Let it happen. Are you getting this? What are they praying it? Verse 29, now Lord look on their threats and grant your service that they all, with all boldness they may speak. Verse 30, by stretching out your hand to heal. But who lays hands on the people? You do, I do, without voodoo. We don't do voodoo, but you do. And I do what he told us to do. And when we lay hands on people, it is like stretching out your hand because he said, you go and lay hands on the sick. Yeah. He didn't say, wait for me to touch them. He said, you go and lay hands on them. You anoint them with, well, I've given you all authority in it now. So when you do it, you pray. You say, Father, as I lay my hands now, stretch out your hand through my hand. Thank you that as I touch this person, you are touching this person in Jesus' mighty name. That's why I say to people, when I lay hands on you, when I walk away, you better be healed. Because I believe you are. Yeah. Now it's up to you to go and believe it. Yeah. And start declaring it and say, no, 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 no. Lord, you remember those days? So and so and so date, hands were laid upon me. I believe that I was touched because as that person, as a servant of Almighty God, laid hands on me, you commanded that person, they will lay hands upon the sick. And they said, Lord, stretch out your hands. So through their hands, you laid hands on me. So Father, according to your word, let it be purposed in my body. What is the purpose in my body? I'm healed in Jesus' name. Come on, I'm teaching you how to pray. Verse 31, and when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. Once again, something supernatural happened. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit again. You can never stop being full. Oh, we know the Holy Spirit came. Oh, pour out your Spirit. No, it's already been poured out. Hey, that pour out your, and I will pour out my Spirit is present continuous tense. He didn't just pour it out once 2,000 years ago. He keeps on pouring it out. So I cry out, I say, pour it out, pour it out, pour it out. Here mark fall. Tot oorlopens to fall. Let it be poured out. Next day, Lord, pour it out, pour it out. Keep on pouring, Lord. Keep on, never stop pouring, Lord. He didn't just do it once. 
When they came together and they prayed in one accord, what happened? The Holy Spirit was poured out again. And then they came, you can go read it. Then they came together again and a third time the Holy Spirit was poured out and they were once again filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a continuing thing. So that you can continually walk in power. Let's just read three or four more scriptures quickly. And then I want to end with these two scriptures. Go to Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6 verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. All prayer. All the, the, I mean, if you pray that our Father, you've prayed basically all the prayers you can pray. Declare it, call in, worship, praise His name. Being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Go to Colossians 4. Just go a little bit further on now. Colossians 4. Verse 1, Masters, give your bond servants what is just and fair, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Continue earnestly in prayer. Give vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Meanwhile, praying also for us. Now, now get this. Meanwhile, praying also for us. So this is like me asking you, keep on praying for us. Keep on praying for me. Keep on praying for us. Listen to this. That God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in chains. That I may make it manifest. Pray for us. That God would open doors for us. That we would speak the mysteries of God. And that when we speak the mysteries of God, that those mysteries may be manifested. Have you got that? That's why you need to pray for your pastor. So that he can open up the mysteries for you, so that those mysteries can be made manifest. Okay, that was a good thing to jump up, whistle and shout and say, Willie, from now on, I will pray for you 24-7-11. So that the mysteries can be opened up. So that what you hear, what you didn't know before, whether it's how to be blessed, how to prosper, how to be healed, God's promises upon your life, supernatural manifestations, praise. doesn't matter what area. If you pray that the mysteries through the one that God gave to you, the gift that God sent you, the gift that God gave you, it might sound arrogant, I don't care, but prophets, apostles, teachers, evangelists, and pastors, they are gifts to you so that the mysteries of heaven can be an open up so that you can get to that level where you can see the manifestation of the things that you didn't know were supposed to be yours. It must be manifested in your life. How do I get it really? Prayer. But you see, we've, we've, we've cultivated a an attitude of, of, of criticism. The pastor preached the long. But what you don't understand is he's opening up mysteries to you so that it can be a manifestation for you. Now he's preaching too long. Now he's shouting too loud. Now he's too direct. And if you don't like him to be direct, then go to that other insurance company <laughs> and go and dial direct. <laughs> Speak the mysteries. Verse 4, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. There's got to be a manifestation of what we speak. But what are you manifesting? Oh, nothing. 
because you don't speak anything. 1 Thessalonians, go a little bit further on. I can actually just tell you what 1 Thessalonians says. Verse 3, uh, 1 Thessalonians 3. Reason. Verse 10. Go for verse 9. For what thanks can we render to God for you for all the joy with which we rejoice for your sake before our God? Night and day praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. So Paul says we are also actually praying so that there can be a manifestation in your life. Close to the end and then two more scriptures. Go to Jude. It's close to, close to the book of Revelation. Verse 20. Look, look this way. Don't read it. Don't read it. Look at me. Look, look at me. But you. This is how it starts. But you. So just say this with me. Say, so me. So me. All right. Now read it. Beloved. Building yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Ek is moederloos. Okay, sorry, no. Ek is moederloos. Not motherless. Ek is moederloos. Ek weet nie meer nie. Ek kan nie meer nie. No, beloved, what does it say? Build yourself up in your most holy faith. I don't have faith anymore. I don't know anymore. Start praying in the Holy Spirit that is able to build up your holy faith. But we don't do that, do we? So if you don't know how, if you cannot, you go, I, I knew a pastor. I mean, man, he, it sounded like he only knew three words. It sounds like he stutters. But you know what? When he started praying, I won't mention names because I don't want to, you know, but it was in Pretoria at a big church. But you know, when he opened his mouth, and just those little words that he said, I mean, you should be able to pray a vocabulary. You should be able to pray a few sentences. But I mean, there was an anointing on him, because when you open your mouth and you start praying in the Spirit, it's the Holy Spirit. So it doesn't matter whether you just go, Shama Mama, Shama Mama, Shama Mama. If you believe that that is what the Holy Spirit gave you, then you pray it, and you speak it, and something happens. What happens? You build yourself up. I mean, man, when he started praying like that, you could sense that there's something in the air. Something in the air. You can feel it. In me. Okay, sorry, I'm getting distracted now. But, but that is what happened when he started praying. So why wouldn't you pray in tongues? Come on, I'm challenging everyone sitting under my voice right now. And even you watching this DVD or, 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 or on YouTube or whatever. If we understand the power of prayer, why don't we pray in tongues? Why don't we pray the words of Almighty God? Why don't we declare the stuff until there is a manifestation? The same effort you use, the same energy, the same amount of words you use to speak negative and to be negative is exactly the same you can use to pray positive. Let's finish. Praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God. That's one scripture we miss. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Christ unto eternal life. We've got to walk in love. Doesn't mean I agree with everything you do and you say. We all have to work on that area. Right, last two scriptures. Go to James. Now that's just people back from Jude again. Go to James. We know this one. But let's do it. Okay, look this way. Honestly now. 
How many of you have gone through some sufferings? Now, sufferings is not just, you know, persecution and disease and pain and sickness. I mean, suffering is also when you don't have enough. Suffering is when you're not happy. Suffering, so suffering encompasses a lot of stuff where you don't manifest the fruit of the Spirit or the, or the breakthroughs or the stuff. So how many of you have gone through some sufferings? Okay. How many of you have asked people to pray for you when times are difficult? Would you please pray with me? Okay, can we shoot that holy cow? Verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. I'm going through a terrible time. Will you please pray for me? No, you go and pray. There's a difference when I stand in agreement with you while you are praying. I'll stand in agreement with you. Father, give strength. Help. But when you suffer, you pray. You see, we look for an easy way out. Will you pray for me? Why? I'm going through a terrible time. No, you pray. You see, once again, it's because you're doubting the anointing and the ability of the Holy Spirit that's in you. You're doubting yourself. You're doubting your sonship. You're doubting Him. Because He gave you the power. So why don't you take authority over your long suffering, over your suffering, and start declaring, it'll change, it's going to change. I command change. I have the keys. Whatever I bind, I say that this is unlawful, it's unrightful, it's not right. And I'm going to, uh, 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 I'm, I'm going to lose. What is it? I'm going to declare what is happening to me illegal. <coughs> I'm going to declare the blessings of Almighty God. That's legal. Because that's what that scripture means. So is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders. Now, now we're getting to a different story where we get the prayer of agreement. For the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Let him pray. Let them pray. But if you are suffering, you begin to pray. Hello? Because there's power in your prayers. The law of scripture. Did you get something so far? Now, I want you to see something. This is where I want to end right now. I mean, we can carry on with prayer, prayer, prayer. But you need to go and look at this over and over. And look at those scriptures over and over. To get the breakthroughs over and over. Prayer, I want to say this. Go, in the meantime, go to the book of Revelations. Looking at the life of Jesus, the prayers of Jesus had the ability to open the spirit realm, the supernatural. The corporate prayer of the believers had the ability, first at the temple, to have an angel manifest, to have other stuff happening. To have the Holy Spirit and power come down. To get prayers answered. So, the, so prayer has the ability. I'm going to say it again. Prayer has the ability to get you from the natural into the supernatural. To get you from where he is. From where you are to where he is. To get his glory, his power, his awesomeness manifested. It also has the power to get the supernatural down to the natural. Etc, etc. So go to Revelations chapter 8. Why would that be? Because of this. Now remember, when Zechariah was the priest of that day, he was getting ready at the altar of incense. 
Now, incense is the stuff that you burn, that comes up, that smells nice. And the Bible teaches us, I think it's in, it's in Corinthians, that it teaches us that a, a sweet-smelling aroma, we carry that sweet-smelling aroma. What has that got to do with prayer? So glad you asked me that question, Louise. Now remember what happened when the priest was at the altar of incense and the people started praying. What happened? The angel appeared at the altar of incense. There's, there's a hidden mystery there. Chapter 8. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. So that's proof for half an hour there will be no woman in heaven. Okay. That's a joke. Okay, no. And I saw the seven angels who stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Then another angel, now get this, here we go. Having a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense. That he should offer, now, now get this, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. I want you to hear what your prayer does. Let's carry on. And the smoke of the incense with the prayer of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, threw it to the earth, and there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and earthquakes. So the seven angels had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. I'm seeing something that I didn't see before. So the moment that you begin to pray, angels are ready to gather your prayers and then get them with the incense, the sweet smelling anointing oil and pour it out on the altar of incense which is before the throne. And when that is done, the angels then take that smelling offering with your prayers, and throw it down to earth, which leads to supernatural manifestations. Like lightning and thunder. That's what your prayers do. It brings angels on the scene. And what happens? There's a sound. When it talks about the seven angels with the seven trumpets, it doesn't mean, and we get this picture, and this is how we get indoctrinated with wrong doctrines and teachings and stuff. Our children's Bible and stuff have angels standing there with those long trumpets and go, uh, bu, 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 and shh. No, the word for trumpet there means like a voice. So they were making announcements. So while you are blowing trumpets on this earth by through the voice, through your prayers, you are making sounds. What happens? Angels are scooping it up and say, let's get it on the altar of incense, man. And they throw it out on the altar of incense with the incense. And it fills the throne room with a sweet smelling sacrifice, aromas. And then the angels take that and they throw it down back onto the earth. And there's a sound and there's lightning and thunder. And your prayers takes you into the super supernatural throne room of God and it brings the throne room of God the supernatural from there to be manifested on this earth that's your prayers so why wouldn't we pray it's because we don't understand what truly happens in the spirit realm when we begin to say my father Jesus hung on the cross. He cried out, My Father. My Father. He was praying. Yeah. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Whew. Heaven and earth connects. Mm -hmm. Natural and supernatural. Yeah. Next moment, <laughs> lightning, thunder, earthquakes. Because there's a connection yeah. by calling out my Father. 
my father who is in heaven. Oh, but now you're in my heart too. You are on this earth. In me, through me. Ooh, your will be done. Let there be lightnings and thunders. Miracles and wonder. Huh? Get that song ready. Just play it when I tell you to. I don't know what it's called. Lightning and thunders. Miracles and wonders. Heaven on earth. That's what your prayer is. That's what happens when you pray. Prayer is not just to soothe your conscience. Prayer is not just something that you do quickly at night. Thank you, Father, for a nice day. Thank you that you protected me and my family. Thank you that as we sleep tonight. No, that's only to soothe your conscience. We need to say thank you. But there's got to be times. We did that the previous session. Where you go into your inner room, your dispensary, And you take out of your dispensary all the medicines, the words, the promises of God. You close the door of negativism. You go into your storehouse, into your room. You close the door. You go into your dispensary and you begin to dispense, hand out, give out, declare His promises. And you close the door of negativism so that no negative thought, negative ideas, negative words can enter into your mind by speaking from your dispensary. There's got to be a time like that where you make room to pray like this. There were times, and it's, and it's good uh, uh, to share this with you because it reminds me and it inspires me and it encourages me. And I want to encourage you with it as well. Times of prayer. When I was praying, I remember one time. I, uh, I was lying on my stomach years ago. I was lying on my stomach and I was just crying out to God. Not for something specific. Just your presence. And the next moment, I felt Two arms, two hands, one coming under my chest and the other one under my, uh, yeah, no, not thighs, the top of my legs, between my knees and my hips. And the next moment, I was lifted up from the floor about this high, about 30 centimeters. And I'm just lying like this, and I'm levitating, and I'm busy praying. I'll take you to the very place. It's a house in Paro. Never forget this. And I was praying. And I don't know for how long because you lose track of time. And when I finished praying, I said, thank you, Jesus. The next moment, I was put down and I'm on the floor. Another time, I'll take you to the house. It's in Secunda. I was, I was going through a difficult time spiritually. I was. And Ansi, they were still small. And Ansi and them were already sleeping and I was sitting in the sitting room and I was sitting on my, on my, you know, with my hips on my backside with my arms like this on the, on the couch. And I was just crying out to God for His presence. And the next moment, I felt hands lift my arms and my head up like this. It's like someone that wants to sit down, but you're in the way. And lift my arms and sat down and placed my arms and my head on a lap. And I immediately knew it was Jesus. You just know. And while I was just sighing, I didn't even say a lot. I was just more like... <laughs> and it's like his hand was doing this over my head. Just comforting me. And without any words, I knew he was saying, it's going to be okay. But just that presence... And another time, I started praying. I was kneeling. I, I started, and I was, you know, on my knees, Nick, on, you know, with a couch, my elbows like this. And I was just going, and I stopped, and I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. I said, 
I looked up. I said, angels, who knows the presence of God better than you that have 24, 7, 9, 300. I, I mean, you are constantly in his presence. You have access to his presence. Who understands his presence more than you? I said, any angels that are with me right now, I invite you, come and pray with me. I invite you, come and pray with me. And then I closed my eyes. I invited them. They must show up. I closed my eyes and I started going, oh, Rama. I said, help me, help me. And I made as though there's an angel next to me on my left and on my right and an angel on my left. So I went to the angel. I said, come on, help me, worship me, get me there. I said, come on, help me, worship me, get me there. And I, by faith, I, closed, I said, oh, Rama. And the next moment, I felt two presents knelt next to me, right next to me, and I could feel how the cushions, you know, how your elbows makes imprints, I could feel how the cushions, and man, the next moment, I was going, I didn't hear them, I didn't open my eyes to look, I didn't want to, but I knew they were there, I could feel them, they were right next to me, and the next moment, it was like my prayer was lifted up to a higher level, and I was going, Ooh, and, I, and at one stage in it, I just opened my eyes, I couldn't see them, but I I knew they were there. And I waited and I said, go for it, go for it. And they said, help me, help me, help me. I said, oh, this is like, oh, shit, but I'm a heart. Until I finished. And the next moment you could sense the cushions go, and they're gone. Some account is like that. Now, why wouldn't we pray? Now, we don't always have these encounters. But we can. But we don't always. But whether we have those manifestations or not, we still do it by faith. Because the word says, he hears us when we call. 